On y va, c'est parti! Oh, good, you're awake. Looked like you were going into hibernation there for a minute. It's me, Anglo. The pilot? I know what you're thinking. Shouldn't you be flying the plane? Nah, these things basically fly themselves these days. <laughs> Sorry about the turbulence. We've been going through some clouds lately, but sit tight because in 10 minutes we'll be touching down at our destination, Quebec's capital and oldest city. So pretty, they named the province after it. Quebec City. Founded in 1608 by French explorer Samuel de Champlain. Hold it. Right there. Back it up. Weren't there some people here first? Oh, that's right. There were people here way before that. Okay, so scratch that. Until Monsieur de Champlain came and called it Quebec, there were many diverse communities all across the land with their own ways of life, languages, and dialects. I wonder what they called it. They passed their history and culture to each generation through oral tradition. So let's find someone at our next stop who can tell us about it. In the meantime, here's today's in-flight meal. It's a Mae West. Actually, you know, the Mae West was invented in Quebec City. Bet you didn't know that. Of course you didn't. I used to be just like you, you know. Clueless. Until I talked to Quebec historian Rod McLeod. You know what? You should listen to my chat with him while you eat that. Here, put these headphones on. You might learn something. Let's turn the clocks back a little to answer one simple question. How did we even get here? How did current day Quebec come to be an English speaking Quebec in conjunction? With us today is Rod McLeod. Rod is a Quebec historian and former president of the Quebec Anglo Heritage Network. And I have him here on Zoom right now. So let's talk to him and find out what beaver pelts had, had to do with the, the life that we now enjoy here in La Belle Province. Hi, Rod. Uh, hi, Anglo. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for uh, taking the time. Not at all. I'm, uh, I'm trying to think what I'm going to do with beaver pelts. That's, <laughs> uh, it's a critical corner of, of our history, of course, because that's one of the, the major bits of natural resources that uh, people exported to Europe. And any sort of painting you might see in the 19th century, you know, these impressionist paintings of people in these fancy hats, those were all made from beaver pelts that came from, uh, came from Canada. So it's a major industry, if you like. So I'm happy that I did remember that correctly. I was trying to be a little bit cheeky, but it turns out that they were very important because, I mean, I love those hats and I, who doesn't really? But I guess that does kind of tie into to what, we're, what we're trying to get into. So no pressure, Rod, but you, you are the first guest on C'est La Vie. And I figured uh, to help paint the picture of Quebec as we know it, um, illustrating the historical context would be a natural prologue and a good way to, to set the stage for this series on English speaking Quebec. So, so I don't know how you came to know what, what you do, but if you don't mind, please enlighten us. Tell us <laughs> uh, a story, the, the story of current day Quebec and how it came to be. And I guess, in a sense, our story. Right. The question is, who are we really? Because uh, I think I'd like to I'd like to get across this idea that, that we are a very diverse uh, group and have always been so. Uh, a lot more diverse in all kinds of ways today, and yet in a funny kind of way, much more united than we ever were. Um, and part of that, I think, is because we, as a community, haven't always realized that we are a community or haven't thought of ourselves as a community. One of the things to keep in mind is that uh, Anglophones only started to be aware of themselves as Anglophones and to call themselves Anglophones, you know, maybe like 40 years ago. Um, for most of its history, I think people took for granted the fact that uh, they were here uh, in, a, in a sort of a, a British colony, um, which Canada was until 1867, and even so, a, a sort of a, a affiliated with the British monarchy and so forth. So the English language is spoken right across North America and 
So you're just part of that big picture. And it's, in a way, the more subtle question is how speakers of French, uh, even in Quebec, maintain that language and, in fact, uh, in the past 50 years, managed to sort of restore it to a position of considerable prominence. Um, and it's at that point that, that Anglophone Quebecers began to think, realize, oh, you know, we, we actually are a, a minority within uh, within a minority that is itself, within a majority that is itself a minority, right, within uh, North America. People just thought of themselves as, as, as part of a basically English-speaking North America. On this theme of diversity, there would be a real wave of immigration um, starting in around the 1820s, right through uh, the century. Um, a lot of people from the British Isles, as the British Empire felt the need to um, in, increase the population of its colony with an eye to the American uh, colony, American uh, Republic as it's emerging. And when I say diversity too, I mean, I don't want to forget um, certainly uh, groups from other parts of the world, non-European groups. Of course, we have uh, an indigenous population uh, here that interacted from the very beginning uh, with all kinds of Europeans who uh, came over to this side of the Atlantic. Um, Many of them interacted more with English speakers, and that has a lot to do with why uh, some of the um, uh, some of the indigenous groups, uh, even in Quebec, have, have a strong affiliation to this day with with the English language. Uh, whether they want to call themselves Anglophone is a whole other question, but that's uh, that's part of an ongoing ongoing discussion. And we also have to uh, talk about uh, the fact that there was uh, a strong black presence in. Quebec going back again almost as far as any European presence. Um, a lot of it is connected with the with slavery, um, but by no means all. We have our own little role in the um, what's called the Underground Railway, uh, escaped uh, slaves from the United States uh, coming up here, um, and um, we also have a long history of racism that uh, we are uh, still dealing with, um, and perhaps uh, lately more than ever. Um, a lot of this, of course, is sort of in the background uh, until well into the 20th century. Um, I'd like to make a special reference to uh, a very sizable Jewish community, uh, especially in Montreal, but in many other parts of Quebec. Um, by the uh, 1920s, I think about 7% of the Montreal population was, was Jewish. And... Um, that's, of course, incredible uh, cultural uh, impact. Um, and also, as of the 40s, certainly after the Second World War, we start seeing uh, immigration from uh, all corners of the globe. The, um, the big background to this is, is, is the interest that most groups have had over the years when they've arrived in uh, almost any part of North America, but certainly in, in Quebec, in our case, to integrate with the North American continent. They have felt the English language is the way to, uh, our ticket to, to you know, integrating with, with this large economic and cultural world. So the, um, there are these sort of waves of, uh, of different groups that uh, all see the experience of coming to Quebec and other places as we're coming to North America and we want in the big ticket to that in a way is learning English. Uh, so obviously that's the, the, the challenge. Um, and we have plenty of schools here that would teach you English. So it's, it's no wonder that people, people did that. And it was only when with this sort of rise of a sense that, that hey, this is the, the, the French language and, and people of French origin have uh, a real place here. This is the Quiet Revolution. This is the, the, the bilingual and bicultural commission in the 1960s that, that revealed all kinds of social and economic inequalities between uh, French speakers and English speakers and saying, what, what can we do to, to improve the, uh, the lot of French speakers? Um, that, that French itself became a, uh, first of all, a language of, of business and culture and also an official language uh, in this province. The counterpart to that story is Anglophones sort of saying, hang on, we have a very particular place here. At the same time, uh, people who uh, have opted 
whether it's recently or for generations uh, to speak English in this province, uh, realize that a lot of the, the ethnic and cultural differences that may have divided them uh, generations before uh, no longer do. And, and that the, the, the real challenge is to um, how do we integrate uh, ourselves into this uh, basically francophone political structure and, and, and culture? Um, and I think the vast majority of, of Anglophones have, have accepted that challenge and they're constantly working at it. Thanks a lot, Rod. This this stuff becomes more interesting the older the older I get. Um, just how things things unfold as they do, and then the ripple effects that they have on on our lives today, and in, in the distinct ways that they do. Um, and and just the fact that we wouldn't even be here today if if all of that didn't happen as it did. So that connection is so uh, apparent and uh, fascinating. And and so knowing more about our history and how things went down is so important. And uh, and now we do. Thanks to you, Rod. Well, I appreciate the chance. Thanks very much indeed. So, was I right or was I right? Okay, now that you've got your foot in the door, take a look out the window. See that? That's the St. Lawrence River, or Kania Tarawanane, which means big waterway in Mohawk. Pretty cool, right? And look over there. You see that building on the cliff? That's Le Chateau Fontenac, Quebec's most iconic building. Ah, it's a lot bigger than I remember. Wait, if that's there, and I'm here, ah, oh, chipmunk, hold on. Coming in hot. Bienvenue à la ville de Québec. Okay. Okay, let's head into town to meet with some of my new friends. I have a feeling you're gonna like these guys. First stop, the VEC, the voice of English-speaking Quebec. We're going to pop over to meet with Susanna Tang. She's going to tell us all about how the VEC supports newcomers and English-speaking youth in the greater Quebec City region. And stay tuned for a special performance from Andrea Paperni as she takes us above the clouds. Okay, we got no time to waste, so we'll be taking the swoosh. Oh, you don't know what the swoosh is? Watch this. Hi, Susanna. I'm Anglo. So I know we have some business to get to here, but before we do, I was hoping you could quickly introduce yourself and tell us how you, an English speaker from Ontario, came to find yourself in Quebec City and how you've been able to carve out a Susanna-sized space for yourself there. Well, it all started after a trip to Paris. After enjoying the sights, the art, the desserts, I left with a promise to return and a goal to improve my French. So I began taking French classes and even looked into jobs in France but that wasn't going anywhere. And that's when I decided to take a closer look at Quebec. And I applied for the Odyssey program. I was accepted and I arrived in Quebec City in the fall of 2016. And now you're here and you're, you're working at the VEC. So what are you up to over there? So I'm not a youth anymore, but this organization VEC supports youth as well. We're an organization with a mandate to serve, support, and advocate for the English-speaking community. In fact, our name is the Voice of English-Speaking Quebec. I'm working on two projects tackling youth employability. The first involves showing students a variety of different job and educational opportunities available to them here in Quebec City. We had hoped to do some career day presentations, but with COVID, that's not possible. So we've also started a podcast, the Pathways Podcast. On our podcast, you'll hear local people talking about their career journeys, what they do day to day, what they find challenging, what they love about their job. We've interviewed a number of people, including a cartoonist, a politician, a visual effects animator, a hairstylist, a biomedical researcher, the list goes on. And all of them offer something really, really special and different in terms of their advice, and they speak from the heart. I know that employment is a major concern for young English-speaking Quebecers at the moment, so it's great that you guys are tackling that with the podcast. Um, so again, that's the Pathways podcast. And what else are you guys doing to support youth employability? In addition to the podcast, we have a job board that you can find on our website, veq.ca. On our website too, we have a list of employers that are specifically looking to hire people with English skills. We also wanna recommend some of our partners the Calfour Jeunesse Emploi Centers, as well as YES. And here in Quebec City, there's also the FORT program. So some great suggestions for anyone living in Quebec City 
or anyone thinking of moving there. If that's you, definitely check out the VEC and see how they can help you on your way. Suzanne, I have to say, I'm, I'm sold. Once this pandemic lifts, you, you might be hearing from me. I might, I might come pay you guys a visit uh, in the near future, if, of course, you'll have me. Thank you, Misa. We'd love to have you. Can I just add that I want to give a shout out to all the youth as well. I want to say, keep up your fight for a better world. I'm really inspired by what I'm seeing. Thanks, Susanna. All right. Next, we have Benoit Mathieu. He's an English speaker with a French name. So is he here to figure out some sort of identity crisis? Let's find out. Hi, Benoit. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, from what I know, it seems that you've taken the road or at least a road less traveled to get here. So, so tell us, where are you from? So the short answer would be I grew up in Virginia in a family of uh, primarily Francophone backgrounds. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Benoit Mathieu, I, I mean, that's not a common Virginian name. So I, I felt like there might be some, some French uh, history or lineage there. So my family is uh, from Francophone, Louisiana. They are, there are two uh, main communities that people often think of in Francophone, Louisiana, Cajuns and the Creoles. Uh, my family is primarily, I guess what you'd call Creole, Louisiana. What brought you here in the first place? A combination of reasons, um, including curiosity, uh, a dream to live abroad, particularly in, in a Francophone place, and also a desire to connect with a larger Francophone identity in a very tangible way. Um, just to, to add to that, you know, I'd like to see uh, more of a recognition of the diversity of immigrant experiences, immigrant stories. I think that we, as a global society, tend to think of immigrants as being solely motivated by economic and or political reasons. However, as my story, I think, illustrates, not all immigrants are motivated by these reasons per se, and some are more motivated by more abstract personal reasons, which I think certainly does not negate the legitimacy of their experiences. And I think that we could all benefit by more explicitly recognizing the diversity of immigrant experiences rather than perpetuating the conceptualization of immigrant stories in very stereotypical and homogenous terms. I think it's important to recognize that most stories are often more complicated than they may seem. And it's often a combination of various elements that comprises a whole or a whole story in this case. I wanted to ask you as, as an immigrant to, to Quebec, have you integrated well here? Has that been easy? You know, when I first got here, there were definitely some, some challenges. I think everyone you know, experiences challenges, particularly moving in a new place, moving to a new place. Um, I think, you know, over, over time that, you know, got better. Uh, I, I mentioned confidence being a major issue. And I think w with time um, and, and having more experience here, I think that definitely kind of helps uh, to, to kind of find my, my way here. Uh, professionally and personally, for example. So I think that that kind of happened gradually. I think for most people, it's like that as well. It's kind of a, a continual, uh, gradual process that, that takes time. It takes time, it takes patience, and it takes, it takes work and effort as well. For sure. And how was your French when you first got here? So I came here with a, you know, a basic understanding of French. I had studied French in school. Um, I never lived in a, in a Francophone place. Uh, when, I first, when I first came here, I was able to kind of communicate yeah, on a very, very basic level. Um, I would say that my biggest, my biggest issue in coming here uh, was, was a confidence issue, speaking French. Um, I think uh, with more practice, uh, living here and speaking, um, and also a kind of a, a mindset shift that kind of happened gradually. Um, I think uh, there was a point when I kind of became more comfortable speaking French rather than asking people could, you know, speak to me in English, for example. Um, would you like to stay? I would. Yeah, I have, I have no reason to, to leave Quebec. I'm, I'm happy in Quebec. So last question, would you recommend your path to other people? Has it been a good experience? I would. Yeah, I, I would definitely recommend my, my path to others. Um, you know, it's, it's been a good experience. It's been also a very enriching experience. Um, you know, just to, to address non-Francophones in particular, maybe wishing to, uh, to move to Quebec or spend time in Quebec, I think it's absolutely crucial that we all truly recognize and respect the importance of the French language in Quebec's identity. Um, I think it's ultimately the responsibility of individual non-Francophones wishing to reside in Quebec to put in the time and energy necessary to acquire a level of French proficiency that allows them to feel comfortable living and actively participating in a Francophone place. 
and therefore content to remain here, to remain in the province. I think that taking ownership of one's linguistic journey is ultimately, uh, is, is really fundamental to a successful integration in Quebec. Benoit, I could not have said that better myself. Um, and before we go, I just want to say, uh, I find it so brave that you just picked up and, and moved to a new place with a basic understanding of the, the language. And it's inspiring that you're making it work. I think it's a great lesson to a lot of people currently living in Quebec or, or anyone looking to move here who thinks their French is inadequate. I mean, the fact that you were able to do that and acculturate so well that you now work in an 100% Francophone workplace should give people some confidence that it can be done. So we appreciate your time, Benoit, and uh, keep being bold. Thank you. Appreciate it. He's a 25-year-old named Michael Galveo, and like many of us, he comes here by unique means. So I wanted to find out a little bit more about how he got here and how he's getting along. Hi, Michael. I'm Anglo. Thank you for having me here. So if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to find yourself in La Belle Province. Of course. My journey is a long one, though. It all started when I was born in the Philippines back in well, 25 years ago. Um, my family and I moved to uh, Edmonton, Alberta when I was 10 years old, and I, I lived there for over 15 years. And uh, it was just until last year that I decided to move out of Edmonton and uh, live in La Belle Province here in the uh, Capital National. Um, what made you decide to come to Quebec City? When I was doing my undergraduate, I wanted to learn uh, the French language, but not just in the conventional, like going into a classroom uh, for 90 minutes, uh, you know. I wanted to be immersed in the uh, culture here in Quebec. And a friend told me to uh, go sign up for the uh, Explore program, which uh, I did. I looked into it. And I chose uh, to be in Quebec province uh, to do a five-week immersion program. And honestly, it was one of the best experiences I've had in my life. Uh, the tuition is free. Everything was great. Accommodation, the people. It was, it was just amazing. I would highly recommend it to all the Anglophones who would like to be immersed or like to live, you know, try out to live in, uh, to live in Quebec. Absolutely. And you liked it so much that you decided to stay here in Quebec. Yes, uh, I finished my undergraduate. I went back to uh, Edmonton. I finished my undergraduate, uh, my undergraduate studies there. And uh, I, I redid the Explore again, but uh, here in Quebec City. So I did another five weeks immersion. And then after that, I got me a job at the uh, Odyssey program, which is another uh, program uh, sponsored by the government of Canada. And uh, I worked there from September to May as an English monitor. And uh, that's how I rooted myself here in the La Capitale Nationale. So what are the qualifications for the Odyssey program? The qualifications are pretty minimal, actually. Um, all you have to be is to be a Canadian citizen, at least enrolled in two years of university. Uh, you have to be willing to travel, be adventurous, and just take pride in being an Anglophone or if you are in a Francophone, you know, just show your culture, share your culture to uh, the locals here. So Michael, what made you want to stay in Quebec City? I just love it here. The first time I've seen Quebec City back in 2018, I just fell in love with it. It's like the most European city I've ever seen here in Canada. And uh, apart from that, I just love the, the lifestyle here, the culture, the language and everything. And do you find that it's easy to interact with the city as an English speaker? Yes, actually. If you have any basic knowledge of French language, just saying bonjour with the local, they can tell that you're an Anglophone, so they usually just switch their language to English. But uh, for me, as my experience, yeah, it was, it was easy to interact with the uh, locals here. Like, I can definitely see myself here living next five years even. Yeah. Yeah, well, we hope that this whole uh, pandemic situation clears up soon so you can find out a way to uh, make that happen for yourself. Thank you so much. Next up is Jacob Berglez. Like some of the most Anglo of Quebecers, just kidding, he comes here by way of Ontario. So let's check in with him and see how he manages to make it work. Hi, Jacob. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. First things first, Berglez. Uh, where's that name from? 
Uh, so that name comes from Yugoslavia, actually. My grandparents moved here uh, many, many years before I was born. And that's where the name comes from, yeah. Oh, cool. It's just the, the first time I've ever met one of the uh, Berglez and that four uh, letters in a row without a vowel just stood out to me. So I just had to ask. Uh, but I guess it's a good lead in because uh, to my knowledge, that's not a common name around here. So, so please tell us, how did you, one of the Berglez, end up in Quebec? Yeah, well, uh, it all started, I guess, uh, in a small town about an hour east of Toronto called Port Hope. Uh, I grew up there. Uh, my family still lives there. I went to high school there. And shortly after graduating high school, I moved to Banff, Alberta. And I spent two years in Banff. Uh, I went there to, to snowboard the mountains and make new friends and kind of experience a bit of adult life living on my own, supporting myself. Uh, and that was a really, really good experience. About halfway through my time in Banff, I met a girl and we hit it off and we lived there together for about a year and found out towards the end of our time there that we were going to have a baby. So at that point, uh, we had to do a lot of kind of thinking. Yeah, a lot of really deep thinking to decide what we wanted to do. And it came to a consensus that we would move to Quebec City. Uh, so that we could be closer to my girlfriend's family, uh, which has turned up to be a, a real big blessing. Um, and yeah, so we moved to Quebec City about five years ago, and we've been living here ever since. And it's been a wonderful experience. I went to college here. I studied accounting and business administration at Sage Up St. Lawrence in the PW Sims program. And I'm now working at Jeffrey Hill Community Partners as a foundation coordinator. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm really happy that you guys are managing to find a, a home here. And I, I think your story just encompasses the experience of coming of age as, an, as a young adult, albeit a little more turned up, um, that I think a lot of young people can relate to or, or learn from. Just going from being young, untethered and looking for adventure to to life and responsibility quickly catching up and forcing you to go on the adventure that may not have been planned but possibly the one that was needed i, I guess what i'm trying to say is that the pressure and responsibility may not have been what you asked for but it forced you to get your life together in a hurry which is an experience that uh, i think a lot of young people resist but really might be as you said the motivator for them to take the next and what some would consider one of the hardest steps into adult autonomy. And when you first got to Quebec City, was it easy to integrate and, and maneuver uh, effectively? Uh, somewhat, uh, because I had family here due to my girlfriend. Uh, it really helped a lot with like finding a job at first. Uh, I did get a job in a factory when I first moved here. It was very, very difficult to integrate into that job though, because there were only two other people in the factory who spoke English at all. Everyone else, not a word really. So that was difficult. Uh, yeah, that was really difficult. And people had warned me uh, before moving to Quebec uh, that it would be really hard, but I think that it was easier than they had warned me about. And I think that helped kind of going and expecting the worst and then seeing the light when mm -hmm. I got here. But yeah, it's been a, a wild ride. Well, Jacob, it was great to talk to you and uh, stay in touch because we want to know how it all turns out. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. Our last guest of the day is also our featured artist, Andrea Piperni. Andrea is a Montreal born and based singer and songwriter who blends neo soul R&B, and jazz to create a sound that feels both fresh and familiar. Hi, Andrea. Hey. So let me just start off by saying that you have a fantastic voice, and we're, we're wow. happy to borrow it to cap off our first episode. Oh, I'm honored. So I wanted to ask you, you're an artist in Quebec. Um, what's that like generally, but especially as an English speaker who sings mostly in English? Yeah, you know, it's it's a cool thing to be an artist in a city where there are these two kind of um, distinct markets. The French music industry here in Quebec is obviously huge. And it's really, I would say, kind of its own niche. But at the same time, it's very cool because 
there are some artists who have been able to find success in both, you know, the French and English spaces. And, um, you know, look at someone like Charlotte Cardin. She came up on the Quebec show La Voix, and now she releases music in both French and English and has found success like even beyond Quebec. And I think it's very possible for an English speaking artist to do the same, you know, if you want to, uh, you can tap into that market either, you know, you can put out a French version of your own song, or you can even write an original French song, or you can collaborate with a French artist. So we kind of have this unique opportunity here, like you can take advantage of these two worlds, which is really cool and kind of unlike anywhere else. So the record we're about to play is called Above the Clouds, as you know. Um, so give us a little bit of background on the song. And if you don't mind, just go ahead and, and introduce it to the people. Yeah, absolutely. So Above the Clouds um, is a song I released not too long ago. It's a song that for me came from a very personal place. I sort of wrote it almost speaking kind of to myself. And the message behind it is that, you know, we oftentimes like, kind of get in our own way in life. Um, we... Uh, I think most of us, you know, we have a, a voice in our head sometimes that tell us that we're not good enough for something or someone or we're not ready or we don't know how to do something. And we kind of just let uncertainty and fear keep us from doing things because we're scared. And it can be really tough to ignore that and push through that. And the message for me was just really that, you know, a reminder that it's always going to be worth it to take a chance on yourself and just go for it as hard as it is, as scary as it is. You know, the doubts and fears are a normal part of life, but it's just never worth holding yourself back. So yeah, it's just really a song of encouragement. Definitely. I, I would say it's a constant battle for myself included. And that's why, I, you know, I chose this song for the first episode because that definitely resonated with me. And I'm sure a lot of people uh, are going yeah. through the same thing also. And so, yeah, listen to the song, um, find some encouragement and realize that th life is about taking taking these chances. And that voice in your side, your head isn't necessarily the right one. And you'll see with the song that we're about to play, what can happen when you decide to listen to the the more uplifting, inspiring voice. So, so thank you. You, Andrea and enjoy above the clouds thank you each day waking up feeling like you got something to prove don't let it fool you it'll do something to you shut down with your mind made up acting like you got so much to lose won't make it better ain't no warmth in fair weather
Thank you for flying C'est La Vie, and we look forward to seeing you on board next time as we fly to Montreal. Follow Y4Y Quebec on social for details. Anglo out.